Hey everyone, welcome to episode 114 of the Ceres podcast. I'm your host Stelios and the founder and director of Ceres Pure Food Innovation. Christmas is round the corner. We've noticed a huge upswing in sales. It's, it's been a pretty steady year anyway, but you know we're noticing a, a big surge, especially on batters, fish cake mix, seasoned rice flour. Everything is taking longer to source and longer to make. We hope this should settle out after Christmas, but we just don't know. You might notice that some of our packaging is different. It has been increasingly difficult to source the same packaging, but our main goal throughout all of this is to make sure that the consistency of the inside of the packaging, aka gravy mix, fish cake mix, whatever it may be, is consistent and bang on and as as you would expect or as your customers would expect it. So our focus has been really to keep those products quite stable. So really sorry about different packaging, but we assure you that what's inside is the same. A little update, um, we have um, an offer this month on gravy mix. Just go on our website, um, add November 2021, you'll get 10% off, I think, or is it 20% 20 off actually. Um, on top of that, with every order that you make in November, you'll get a free roll of Christmas labels to put on your packaging for your customers. And also you'll get put into a Christmas drawer as well. So the Christmas drawer is three hampers. Last year, there were M&S hampers. This year, probably more likely so to be M&S hampers too. So, you know, you was already going to buy something, so you might as well have your name in a drawer too. So, on to the podcast. As you may have noticed, we have started to add these ads at the beginning of the podcast. We'll never insert ads in the middle to break the conversation, so I hope that's cool. So, now is a real great time to start out a boil-out routine. If you've got any plans to close down over Christmas, why not start with an end-of-year boil-out and start the year fresh? Sarah's deep fry cleaner was formulated to work in all deep fryers, stainless steel, mild steel, gas, electric, tabletop, you name it, it works. Think about it. Any business that's frying regularly, think of McDonald's, KFC, Burger King, think of Five Guys, they have a boil out routine every time they change oils. Every time. So should you. Fact is, the benefit of regular boil outs are endless. Cleaner pans give you better oil life, better food quality, better recovery. But one of the biggest positives is the fact that you're also checking pan integrity a lot more often. With luck, you can find out problems ahead of them actually going pop. It works on all frying ranges and all commercial fryers. Think of it like this. If a vessel is dirty, how can you have clean tasting fried food? Go one step further. How can you add new oil to a dirty fryer? And if your probes have got dirt around them or muck around them, how can they respond to what's actually happening in real time? There's going to be a lag, some latency. So, you know, join the nationals, you know, the internationals. They are boiling out regularly because it matters. It makes complete sense. So can you afford not to have a regular boil out routine? Order your Sarah's deep fry cleaner today at wilserahs.com. Today's episode is with Marcus Borden. I'm really excited about this because I love barbecuing and charcoal. Marcus is passionate about all things cooking outdoors, barbecue, wood fired, campfire cooking, and smoking. He is the editor of UK Barbecue Magazine and All Things Country Wood Smoke, which is also a Facebook group, a brilliant Facebook group, been in it for some for some time. So be sure to look out for Country Wood Smoke on Facebook. He teaches many people how to cook exciting food in the outdoors at barbecue demos and UK barbecue school in in devon he's just for me you know i love cooking on charcoal and i think it's an undervalued way of cooking some people think it's hard it's stressful it's time consuming but you know it is quite a real raw way and you know men especially love standing around a barbecue you know women could do this too as marcus says in this podcast just a great way to cook I absolutely love his cookbooks, Food and Fire, and I'm looking forward to ordering Skewered too, his new cookbook. So grab yourself a copy at any good, good bookstore. I hope you enjoy this episode with Marcus. If you want to follow him, all his links will be in our show notes.
Marcus, welcome to the Sarah's podcast. Thank you, Stelios. How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad. I want to apologise because obviously my uh, timekeeping has been absolutely terrible trying to get this sorted on and off, on and off. But yeah, we're here. We're doing it. It's it's all good, mate. It's uh, challenging times, isn't it? So it's... Yeah, there's always something, isn't there? And um, yeah, yeah. You know, how, how have you been through the whole COVID situation? Um, I guess that's a really good question. So it's been pretty life changing, really, in a lot of ways. And uh, I, I've i changed my whole life, basically, my working life. Um, so many things have changed. So, yeah, it's quite a quite a long question that one to answer. But it's it's all good. It's all good. It's, it's different, I guess. But uh, it's all good at the moment. So, yeah. <laughs> So how does anybody, but let's just focus on you for a second. How does Marcus Borden go from everyday life, and you're going to explain to us what that is, into Barbecue Guru? Give us a brief sort of outlay of how that all sort of came around. So I was a vegetarian for about 14 years and uh, various reasons, mostly being a student and not, um, not being able to afford the quality of meat that I wanted to enjoy, and it carried on for a long time. Um, I started eating meat when we moved to the countryside, and I met my wife, and we moved to the countryside, and you start having bigger and bigger ev- events and inviting family and friends, and I remember feeling particularly stressed by barbecuing flames and I I hear it quite a lot that people really struggle with barbecue now and I I remember the the same feeling uh, and this was a good 12 years ago and I started to look into ways that I could make it a bit easier for myself Um, cooking big joints of meat uh, cooking in different ways um, outdoors and um, I just fell into a big wormhole of barbecue really and it was always my hobby it was always a, a passion that sort of grew, and I, I wanted to find um, find other people like me who enjoyed it. And there weren't many people out there really who were into barbecue as a thing. So I started looking at ways I could um, grow barbecue and help my passion spread to other people. And online social media was a good way of doing that. And it just sort of. I just looked at gaps and opportunities and uh, I mean the whole teaching thing now has become a lot of what I do and I love to help people and that came about again through friends of mine asking me um, for help with barbecuing um, saying they they wanted to learn how to barbecue and not burn the food and um, to be able to cook a bit more so that's where that kind of took off so it's sort of it's just big gaps, really, that I've sort of tried to, to help people with, you know. See, the thing is with barbecue, it, it's a thing. We don't know yeah. why, but it's yeah. a thing. You yeah. know, no one would say, oh, uh, can you help me with stir frying? Or no, no one would say, I guess I guess maybe so much with frying because equipment's involved. But for the most yeah. part, no one's helping each other make, I don't know, baked goods in the oven why huh. is in your mind why is barbecuing a thing what why is it that people invest time and effort into I, I i don't know i think cookery schools is a thing isn't it in general people struggle with cooking and they go to a cookery school for a specific subject so so maybe sort of barbecue sort of simply is another style of cooking but i think like you you, you touched on there, there there is something more about it that people specifically struggle with the equipment and I, I say men, you know, 90, 95% probably of, of people I see who barbecue are men. That doesn't mean I don't want more women to barbecue. I, I'd love to see more women barbecue. But most of the people who barbecue I see are men. So uh, I know that men are expected to do certain things. We're expected to be able to repair cars. We're expected to be able to you know, do DIY, we're expected, so many expectations on us. And one of the things we're expected to do as men is to be able to barbecue. And a lot of people struggle with it, not just men, women, everyone struggles with it. And I, I think that um, that's the opportunity is to help people who are struggling. For me, I see it as something I can do that has a positive impact in the world because I see people struggling. They have a negative experience with barbecuing. They stop barbecuing. You give them a positive experience and positive education and knowledge 
and then they become confident and passionate about barbecuing because it's it's something that they can really enjoy. I think there's something really there's something to be said about I, I enjoy barbecuing. Uh, you know, <laughs> um, anybody that looks at my social media feed will understand that. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I think there's something about standing around heat and fire and cooking i don't know what it is i know that when we have friends around all the men tend to gravitate around the barbecue um you know but i I do think there is one i I actually think that's probably because humans were probably around fire pits you know uh, you know especially in the early days but i do think one of the biggest misconceptions with barbecue is that people think they cook with fire you know, every mm. advert you see on TV that's cooking on a barbecue, you see fire. You don't yeah. actually see white coal. You, you no. see a, you know, you see a flame that's touching the burger or the meat or whatever yeah. it is. As you know, you you can't. Well, maybe you, there is a, a place for fire. To yeah, something. yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. But, yeah. But you know, you cannot cook something very well if you're only using fire, can you? No, no. So, so I think I can answer your first sort of point about the 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 where you know where it came from and and i agree it, there is something deep in us that that fire resonates with and people gravitate towards a fire i i see it quite often when i have um fire here um and people people will just lose themselves in the fire i was, I was we, had, we do a, a kids class here and uh i was watching this lad the other day and he was just totally the fire was flickering in the fire pit he was just totally zoned into that fire and i, I said it's amazing isn't it and he, he said oh it's beautiful and and i could just see that raw elemental passion you know, and hopefully that's encouraged that in that young lad. Um, I see it in my kids. They they sit in. We've got a, an indoor barbecue. I call it a wood stove in our front room. They sit in front in front of it as uh, you know, and, and love just watching the fire. I did as a kid. Uh, I, I think it goes on longer than that. You know, through through uh, many years, we we were actually famed in the UK for our our love of cooking with fire. We were called La Ross Beef. We we were famed for chunks of meat meat in front of the fire you know obviously that's our tradition but so many people have um you know so many people have added to our cultural makeup of of fire cooking as well you know uh we've we've got uh, obviously the greeks with the love of skewers come in kebabs um all that we've got indians with the tandoor all of these have added to our rich what makes our rich culture of fire cooking in the uk and um that is making it incredibly incredibly exciting and mm. um i think the melting pot of of our culture in the uk is making our future in in fire cooking particularly enthralling for me I, lo- I love all the ways you can cook on a fire around the uk so we, we have got the tradition some people say we've got no tradition of barbecue in the uk actually we we have a very strong t- tradition of cooking with fire and we've got this amazing melting pot now of, of cultures that are just um fanning the flames stirring the pot of barbecue i think that uh, I, I, th- I think most cultures do have their own version of cooking with fire i think hmm. what well, one of the one of the ones that surprised me recently was um i did a podcast with uh, danilo cortellini who's an italian chef yeah. and he was telling about from his hometown they have i think it's arrosticini which is basically yeah. barbecued lamb and you think yes. i never i'd never considered that because uh, i you don't think of italians cooking you know i don't know where, i shouldn't fall into the stereotype of all oh, the only have pasta and pizza because they don't yeah, yeah. But you don't ever see men well and maybe i'm wrong here but i don't ever see chefs talking about uh, italian barbecuing ever so that was a surprise to me mm. you know that yeah. they did that also i think what what other countries would you say that have have sort of surprised you with the fact that we don't know that they barbecue, but actually they have a very strong culture of barbecuing. I, th- I think the one that would um, surprise most is probably Spain because, you know, most people think Spanish tapas, um, you know, uh, that nice sort of Mediterranean food. Um, actually like pa- paella was um, something very much cooked over a uh, wood fire, but uh, you, you go up to the Basque country, San Sebastian, and actually, that is one of the, the I think, the epicenters of um, barbecue, really. 
and the, you know the amount of Michelin star restaurants there that there's supposed to be more there than pretty much anywhere in the world in in a small area and a lot of those places are cooking just simple um local beef cooked over fire and um what you know one of the restaurants in particular Eshtabari, is um somewhere i really want to go to where they cook um big uh ex retired dairy old old cow beef over um over over wood embers and that is the kind of food I love that's that that is that is amazing so I think Spain would be be one as well but you know you, anywhere really you know it's um, cooking over fire is is in us all really because you know 100 years ago we didn't have nice um, nice ovens you know nice electric or gas ovens it was cooking in a hearth or cooking over fire that was that was all we had back then so yeah, and I think I, I, you know, when I was younger, we used to go. Well, it's basically Cyprus was our second home, yeah. so I remember, I remember people just saying, "Oh, we're cooking," and they were cooking outside yeah. in similar to uh, the outdoor Italian pizza ovens, but actually more suited for slower cooking. And in yeah. there, they would put like broken up olive tree branches. You know, it wouldn't be coal; it was olive tree branches mostly. Yeah. And that's how they cooked, you know. And you know, yeah. one of the original foods is like gleftigol, which is lamb that's been sh- uh, cooked overnight with co- well, with with wood. And yeah. and that was a normal thing. And even now, in the village I'm from in Cyprus, people will have like this old way of cooking. And you know, yeah. so they haven't they have they have adopted the modern techniques of cooking, like oven yeah. and and hob and so on. They yeah. do that probably all week long. But then on the mm. Sunday, they'll be doing that. Yeah. And, yeah. And, so, but, what, what, you know, and I know you mentioned that, you know, England is quite prominent in the barbecuing scene. Why don't we see more of it? I don't see a lot of it. And, or, and if it no. is a thing, it's mostly in the summer. But do you think that, are you seeing more of an appetite of people coming back to that now? That's that's a really interesting question. Uh, so it, it, it's always been a bit of a bit of a joke, the the, the UK barbecue scene, really, you know, everyone jokes sausages and burgers burning and chicken raw and all that. And it's, it's, it's a bit of a joke. Um, and, and journalists sort of seem to, to sort of, uh, that's the easy option. They go to that and they say, oh, we're really rubbish at barbecue. And I think probably we, we have been for a long time. I think we lost those skills somewhere in the, the convenience food of the 70s and 80s with microwaves, and we, we lost that. I know certainly my, my parents' generation, there were very few people who, who barbecued back then. Um, my, my father certainly never did. But suddenly there is an interest in, I think, all things artisan, really, and barbecuing definitely falls into that sort of category doing things taking your time to cook a bit more um slowing it down uh you know the the low and slow smoking style from america that very much falls into that category taking 14 hours to cook a brisket or something is is um pretty pretty slow down way of cooking and and i think i think especially during uh, during the, the pandemic, the lockdowns, people have had a bit more time to explore some of these things, and I th- I've seen I've seen things growing for the last sort of five or six years, really, um, a, a growth there. But it took off in in the first lockdown. I saw my social media just spike up. I saw the interest spike up. So many people started Instagram uh, barbecue accounts to share their love of barbecuing. And I think that's that is one of the biggest things that barbecuing has is a community, and I've always been about growing that community in the UK, growing that UK barbecue scene, and and helping that to grow. It's um, it, and and I've seen I've seen that more so in the last eighteen months than than ever, and the community has really helped people, and it's really helped um do you think to some degree what's helped also is that is that it's a bit trendy also it's a man thing you know that you know people are investing in Kamada joe's webbers uh, big green eggs if you've got yeah. a bit of money they're getting an ox grill is yeah. it you know is it um you know is it a way of showing people oh, look, look what i'm doing sort of thing i, I think so I, I think there's a thing that you know there, there is a, a lot of people buy barbecue kit to to you know 
I don't think it's I don't think it's to one up on their friends and family. There there is a bit of gear, you know. Pe- people want gear and stuff and nice things and shiny things. They haven't they haven't been able to go on holidays. And I, I think that's possibly some of it is that people haven't been able to go to the places that they want to go on holiday and they crave those those food experiences and um, quite often you sat on a beach as a fire going maybe in Portugal people cooking over fire uh, nice sardines and things people doing you know maybe going to the states you know southern states having um, some nice smoke smokehouse food I think there's a, a travel thing that that has helped that but it's it's community I think more than anything people wanting to support um community and uh, they, they like sharing recipes with friends they like sharing new techniques it inspires other people the community aspect of barbecuing is a huge um a huge thing i think and without yeah. that i don't think it would have it would have gone boom like it has yeah i think what i meant more so and maybe i didn't make my point mm. quite clear i think is what i meant more so is um that so th- that equipment is actually quite fashionable it isn't just yeah. a piece of you know uh, cast iron that just looks crappy it, people you know they're investing in it because it also looks nice it's not just yeah. you know a pit in the in the ground you know so uh, yeah. yeah i think so it and like you say if they're not spending money on holidays then you know an mm. investment in a big green egg for argument's sake isn't yeah. the end of the world is it you no know? no definitely not and i think again that's uh, pe- people have got these outdoor spaces, you know, they've got, I, I, I put it to uh, like Kevin McLeod, Grand Designs and the big bifold doors that open out. That a lot of people have in, been investing in their sort of, you know, these nice sort of kitchens with bifold doors open out onto the garden. They go out onto the garden and what then, you know, they have a patio with a few tables and chairs you know i'm seeing a huge growth in outdoor kitchens outdoor kitchen designs and it's the whole outdoor space that we're um we're starting to invest in now you know maybe people have got all these nice indoor spaces that they're happy with and they want to start doing something in the garden and that's where the nice kit comes in you know a nice outdoor kitchen a nice barbecue uh, you know all these things and 10 or 12 years ago there was very very little kit available there was uh, you know weber kettles there was a few different smokers and gas a few rusty gas grills you know that that was it really there was very little now the range of stuff that is available blows my mind it really does it's um it's quite it's quite shocking what is available now it's great (laughs) it's great I think one of the one of the I don't I'm not a huge fan of gas if I'm honest. It's like mm. uh, I, I don't know, like I, I don't know. Maybe I've not used it right, but in terms of gas cooking for barbecue, I prefer coal. I think, yeah. um, I, in my view, and I might be yeah. wrong, but I don't know. Gas doesn't really inspire me. It just feels like I'm in I'm indoor cooking outside. If that makes yeah. sense, um, yeah, it, it it I can see that. Uh, so um, people. You know, there, there is a bit of snobbery out there that, you know, gas isn't barbecuing and stuff. Uh, ac- actually, most uh, sort of smokehouse barbecue in the States is cooked in um, gas smokers, gas powered smokers. But they add a chunk of wood, you know, to add a nice wood flavor. So, yeah. um, you know, gas for temperature control is is great you know it it takes a lot of the pressure off that there are things now available that that make um charcoal barbecuing easier because people usually choose gas for convenience for clean you know it's cleaner actually i find um the thing i struggle most with a lot of gas barbecues is like acres of shiny sort of stainless steel and um that is a lot of cleaning to keep up a lot of you know the the fat the fr- food drips drips down into the undersides of it and people tend to leave it they're not you know not meticulous at cleaning it and then it gets all festery down there whereas like with with a charcoal barbecue or a wood wood powered barbecue you've got less of that you've got the coals underneath you know they gobble up any um any drips and stuff of fat on there so there's a bit less or, or a lot less cleaning so um for me, that's you know, people say, oh, it's it's harder work with charcoal. Actually, I I would dispute that. Um, you know, some some people like the convenience; they can go and flick on the gas barbecue and start cooking, and uh, you know, 
you can do that to a degree in, in with charcoal barbecuing as well. You know, if you use good good charcoal, you can be cooking on it pretty quickly. You know, within a few minutes sometimes, depending oh, wow. what you're cooking. Um, I think yeah, I think for me, gas is probably great if I was like you say smoking or non or, or mm. contact food, so something that's actually touching the metal. But you see, the yeah. mo- most of the time when I'm when I'm doing sort of what I what I would class as barbecue, which is Cypriot barbecue, yeah. it's non contact. So yeah. it's getting that it's getting it's from the heat of the white coal. So yeah, yeah. and again, then that obviously the fat drips and it keeps going around in circles and so on. Yeah. So I yeah, think for me absolutely. that's probably why I've never really been interested in gas, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I'm not a particular gas barbecue, but I in I guess in my position I have to be um inclusive or I want to be inclusive of of everyone yeah. who you know and if if people are choosing to to cook on gas and that's fine I, I've got to help them get the most out of that. You know it's um I mean gas barbecuing in the UK was the the majority really and and obviously we're seeing huge growth in charcoal and, and wood cooking and uh, and that's great but uh, uh you know i want to help people to get the most out of a gas grill so you know i might advise them to put a chunk of wood near the near the flame so you get a nice nice smoky uh nice smoky flavor um you know and give people a little advice like that and then try and get them over to charcoal when i can <laughs> once they build yeah, I get, exactly that and that's what i was just about to interject actually it's probably a confidence thing it's you know yeah. and and i think once someone or whoever and you know I, you know i, I was I suppose our culture does barbecue a lot. So, you know, you, you naturally build in this confidence, but I suppose, well, there's plenty of times when we've got it wrong. Um, yeah. It, you know, there's always that one bag of coal that just won't bloody light. You know, it happens yeah, yeah. to everyone. So yeah. I think for the most part, I think I can see why people use gas it makes complete sense, but I just don't think it works for every application. But like you say, you've just got to help them use it for the right application. Haven't you? I think so. I th- and a lot of that, like you say, is confidence and education. Um, so many people come on my barbecue classes and they struggle with both of those things. I hear that time and time and time again. People say to, you know, I, I show them a few things to give them a, a bit of confidence on my basic class. People say to me, why has nobody told me how to do this sooner? Why, why is it where this information you're telling me now, why has nobody told me to, to, to put my coals here, my food here, my lid on? What, you know, why, why is that suddenly appearing? And, um, that that was the I guess the opportunity and the the, the thing that I I struggled with was why isn't anyone telling these people telling everyone how to cook you know on a barbecue because it's something people struggle with hugely and it needs it needs people like me to to get you know people like yourself to to explain you know talk to our friends you know pass on that knowledge now because very few people did from the generation above I mean my my dad wasn't really a barbecue he didn't pass on that knowledge to me i've had to learn and make mistakes myself and i made an awful lot of mistakes early on so um i i want to now help people to not make those mistakes yeah I no, it makes complete sense we've all been there and, and it mm. is i guess it is intimidating you know there's a, a you know it's fire as well so you know as much as it draws you to it it is intimidating yeah. um one, one of the things i noticed you said on one of your youtube videos is that you don't use like an igniting fluid or anything um yeah. so uh, why is that then like cause, and is that just come with confidence because we always I always use like a little bit of um uh, i think like uh, just a little bit of lighter fuel just to help the things go in a yeah. bit but i don't always not exclusively i've sort no. of built my i've built up a system now where i don't need it as much as i used to yeah i mean for me lighting uh it, it gets it, I, you can get quite deep on fires and lighting but um for me lighting a fire is the start of the process the start of the cooking and uh, I like to keep it if if it's in contact with food, close proximity to food. I like to keep it as natural as I can. Uh-huh. Um, and, and we've all seen these videos. I'm not saying you're chucking loads of gasoline on or um, <laughs> or or like petrol on, but we've all seen these videos. People chuck mm. like loads of stuff on, and bang, it goes. <laughs> but but um, the the actual lighting is um, you know if you use good quality charcoal, then the lighting process is a lot simpler. Uh-huh. Um, it's something people forget. They use poor quality charcoal and then they struggle to light it. It doesn't um, it doesn't uh, catch easily. So, uh, you know, I think using good quality charcoal is is the key, really, for a lot of people lighting. 
Um, there's all sorts of ways to light it. I use natural little wood wall lighters, and it's yep. little wood wall twists with with natural waxes in. They're brilliant. Um, I've also got a great bit of kit called uh, uh, electric charcoal starter, and it's like a mm-hmm. two kilowatt heater that you put in, and you press a button on it, and literally within seconds the the charcoal's lit and going. It's such a a labor saving device, and you feel like a bit of a a fire sword Jedi warrior with this thing. It's great. And, um, you know, literally you can be barbecuing within a, a, a minute or two with that. So, uh, you know, uh, like, I mean, you're, you're you're doing more sort of open fire cooking, mm-hmm. aren't you? So you, yeah, you've got much. an open grill and um, it's less of a problem there because um, the the any flavours are um, more spread out, any smoke's more gentle like that. When you're cooking in a, on a barbecue with the lid on, everything's more intense, intense. So your lighter fluid might just retain taints of, I think of, what, of that through. One lighter fluid I, I used recently, it's not a fluid, it's actually a gel. It's just ethanol gel. It's just, yeah. all, it's, yeah. it's just well, ethanol. Um, yeah. and then, but then also what I've done, one of the magic things that I've done is um, I, I save all my egg crates. You know? So, you know, that, yeah, yeah. Uh, that sort of papery, you know. And yeah. then if I've got like a, I'll sometimes, I've tried it, but I don't do it all the time. I uh, I just put a bit of olive oil or cooking oil on them and let it soak yeah. in because that takes very slowly. Um, but yeah, the egg crates, they take really fast. The coal then goes. I always like a bit of kindling as well because that yeah, yeah. Just really gets the fire going. It's quite dry. Um, do you know what you can use as well if you, you haven't got any of that handy? Doritos. Yeah, I'll, I've done that as well, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because they're so dry, but they're, they're only yeah, thing yeah. in them is fat. So Exactly. They go up a treat. <laughs> yeah, and I, I've tried that, and, and, and I thought I'd just give that a bash. But I was at my brother-in-law's recently, and he, he goes to me, um, he goes, you know what I use? I was like, don't tell me. And he's like, he literally yeah. uses a bit of white spirit. And I'm like, yeah, I just saw him tipping oh, it yeah. on. And I was like, <laughs> and he's like, I'm, I'm going to set a fire. I want to do it properly. And I'm like, oh, yeah. no. I, but he, he laughs about that. But I think, again, yeah. I think some people just want to get the fire going. But, you know, for yeah. me, the more time I put into preparing my stack, the better yeah. my results every time. You know, Absolutely. Yeah. and I, I always have like an old hairdryer hanging about as well because. Yeah, yeah because it's more of an open pit, I can't use the hairdryer that I'd want to use because my wife will kill me. However, <laughs> I've, I've got her old one. And yeah, yeah. If I have got like a, a bit of a stubborn batch or a lot of coal, because sometimes oh. I'm cooking, I don't know, 10 kilos, 12 kilos of meat on the barbecue because it's quite a big separate yeah. barbecue. So you, you need a lot of coal to get it going. So, um, yeah, sometimes you just get that hairdryer on it and, you know, bobs yeah. are on coal in a few minutes, you I- know. I used to get in a lot of trouble using my wife's hair dryers. So well, you're a brave um, man, mate. You're, a, you're really yeah, brave. Yeah. You know? yeah, but it, it it is you know it makes a, a big difference having a, 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 an air source. I mean, I've got these. They're electric charcoal starters. They've mm. got a fan in, and yeah. they blow hot air on. And I use them all the time. They're such a good good. Um, you know, saves a lot of huffing and puffing. So. Yeah, no, it can be quite stressful, especially when you're in a rush and, you know, mm. and, you know, and there is the odd stubborn batch sometimes. And my, my brother-in-law, he's got like an outdoor sort of, I don't know, like a plastic, um, uh, like a big, not as big as a shed, but it's like an outdoor box thing that he keeps his barbecue yeah. and his coal in. But he had a hole in the top, so it was just dripping mm. water on his coal. He doesn't realise, takes it out when the spring times come around. And he's yeah. like, oh, I'm going to do barbecue. And for love or money, we couldn't like that coal because it was just wet. It was just soaked in. Yeah. You know. Honestly, honestly, damp charcoal is um, you might as well chuck it. Really, yeah, it no. gets it gets. And and what what people quite often do is they'll they'll see it on sale in the autumn. You know, traditional barbecue season ends in the autumn, and you know, company you know retailers will sell off a load of charcoal at the end of the season. People will keep it in their garage, and o- over the season, then try and fire it up in the spring, and it's. Even in a dry garage, it, it attracts a lot of moisture, charcoal. Yeah. So, um, it, you know, quite often people find that come the spring, it's maybe a little bit mouldy. They try and use it, the charcoal, and it's got a bit damp. And it's not you're not going to have a good experience with, with that. So, No, it's um, pretty stressful, isn't it? Pretty stressful. Yeah. So talking about barbecue, and you mentioned it earlier, it's the Americans. Do you think they yeah. get pretty peed off for being typecasted that everything they do is wet and saucy that comes off the barbecue? Because it's not always wet and saucy, is it, their barbecue? No, it's definitely not. I mean, so, so there's so many stereotypes with uh, American barbecue. And, and 
American barbecue is very much the the uh, plat de jour, the you know the current thing. But, you know, everyone's wants wanting to cook a brisket or pulled pork and ribs, and that's been great because that's driving the interest in barbecue. It's it, it really is. But people see these plates of sourced meats and they think that is American barbecue when really American barbecue is. Um, very varied and uh you know you've got texas barbecue which has got just salt and pepper on a lot of it you know and even with that you've got a lot of regional differences you know a lot of variations you know there's a lot of new styles coming in with american barbecue there's a lot of fusion stuff coming in and it's changing all the time so you've got the tradition but you've got the the new stuff as well coming in so it's whether you want to do something purely traditional you know like kansas city would be a typical red sauce you know barbecue um smothered sort of thing but even then that that's generalizing maybe too much you know uh, you, you know you got your carolina sort of mustard style and again that's there's small small regional differences in all these 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 states so to generalize i think on um on american barbecue is you know is um, quite you know is something you don't want to you know, a lot of people do, but I, I, I just think it's, you know, you, you, you got to open yourself up to all these different um, regional variations. Um, and that's just in America, isn't it? It's, you know, that's. Okay. I, I think as, as consumers over here, when we look at anything that, that, that we didn't cook on the barbecue, but has been made available to us. It, yeah. it always is either covered in some dark brown barbecue sauce, whether it's a mm. restaurant or a supermarket ready meal. And I think yeah. it just puts in your head, well, if it's barbecue, it's got to be like that. And I don't yeah, think yeah. that's always the case, is it? No, it's definitely not the case. I mean, you'll, you'll find, so myself and probably quite a lot of people like me um, don't actually like barbecue sauce, your mm. typical brown sort of sauce. I don't like a, most of the, the ones I try really, you know, there are some really good ones out there that, you know, but for me, it's it, it's rather than uh, something that has to be on food to make it barbecue. It's yeah. something that actually is a condiment on the side. Uh, you know, I, I you know, I, I I very rarely do things like ribs with with barbecue sauce. You know, I'd rather do some nice maple syrup or honey glaze or something. You know, and well, one of the things that. I was really impressed to see in your book food and fire was the Alabama white sauce because yeah, yeah. we developed one of the, a, a base for that for a customer some time ago. So when I saw it, mm. I was like, Oh, look at that. Um, and again, that's quite a nice sauce with just well seasoned meat. It just, it goes, yeah, nice. yeah. so, you know, and, and I think mm. not everything has to be swimming, you know, no. and, and, and on your point with brisket, I find that, and I don't know if you agree with this and not being a supermarket snob at all is that if I'm doing a barbecue, I will mm. most likely always go to the butchers because I can explain to them what yeah. I'm trying to do. And and supermarket meat is it's um it's hitting um a very much a very consistent point. And that might be that yeah. customers generally that buy from a supermarket have an aversion to fat. And and mm. actually when you're buying for the barbecue, you need a bit of fat, you know, my yes. view. Yeah. So I, yeah. I think that I don't think supermarkets are doing it on purpose. I think they're doing it because customers do want less fat, they don't want to be paid. Yes all that money for a fatty piece. So when you go yeah. to the butchers and you say, look, um, I want a brisket and it's going on the barbecue, they'll get you the end that is nice and fatty and, you know, rather yeah, than yeah. that dry other piece, you know? Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, it's it's changing though. I've, um, am I allowed to talk about brands now? Yeah, um, yeah. Talk Taylor's, about yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so I've been doing a bit of work with Sainsbury's over the last sort of few years and um, we introduced uh, um, a brisket point and... A uh, nice fatty brisket point, brisket. Uh, sorry, uh, beef short ribs and uh, some some pork pork ribs and uh, pork collars. And they, you know, that was that's quite a big big change for a major retailer to to have something that is barbecue specific. And um, that's a really positive change. And and um, I I like you say. I think I think it is all um, customer customer led. Um, I think we've been taken down a, a, a wrong path with fats. Um, I, I think um, that there are good fats and um, I, I know I'm not certainly not a dietitian, but I know um, I know good animal fats from grass fed animals are, are very good for us. Um, but uh, you know, you, you look at, you look at margarine and um, I think we were thrown a major, um, 
a major insult into our our diet by a lot of the the um very um they're not really even foods but the, the stuff that's been introduced to our diet as food and um actually if you go back many years we we were a lot healthier in a lot of ways it's all the sugars and the the bad fats that have been introduced that i think has has damaged us in in recent decades so i've i've always been about more natural fats anyway butters and you know olive oils and um, good fats meats and fish and, and dairy and it's it's been good i've, I've actually uh, i've been doing like a, a a low carb diet for the last year because i put on loads of weight in um in the first lockdown and i've, I've lost four stone in the last year wow. by meats meats fish vegetables um good fats and um kept it to that and i feel really good and um really healthy and i've lost lost loads of weight by doing that so um, i, I know, know i know exactly what you're saying because I, I i've sort of i played around with the keto diet my weight steadily mm. come down and then i sort of modified it a little bit with the pe diet which is protein energy and just yeah. basically just very low carb and i i sell yeah. carbs i mean you know and i think and, and i've not got an yeah. issue but i just think for the most part you know you know one portion of fish and chips a week isn't going to kill anybody one no. one slice of cake every week mm. isn't going to finish anybody off but you know i read something today and it said that uh, the average child eats in a mm. year more sugar than yeah. the child 100 years ago would have had in their lifetime yeah and, yeah and that's such a striking figure that and that's not just child it's adults too you know yeah, yeah. A, a, another thing I, all week i generally eat very clean and then on a Friday mm. night, I have a bit of family time and we have movie night and I'll eat crap. And, yeah. And, yeah. and and again, it's in moderation. I'm not, you know. I agree, yeah. And I think, but if, if I've probably removed 95% of sugar out of my diet over the last three years mm. and I feel better yeah. for it. I'm not, yeah. I, don't, I don't go to the gym as much as I should. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, <laughs> everything has its own time. And, you know, yeah. one of the, you know, talking of margarine, I'm not a big fan of margarine. If I'm mm. honest, um, like you say, butter is so much better. But one of the things we have in our industry is a lot of people will use rapeseed oil and, yeah. they'll, and they'll use rapeseed oil because they were told that it's healthier. And I'll mm. say to them, well, because it's got a lower saturated fat content. Yeah. However, it doesn't last no way near as long as something with mm. higher saturated fat, which actually means that it's actually worse for you now because you're using yeah. something that's well beyond its best. Um, yeah. And, you know, when you read up on the history of rapeseed oil in the 1900s, it was used as an axle lubricant. Yeah, yeah. And you think, well, mm. nowadays we're frying with it and eating with it. And, you know, so mm. it, and that's not to say that there isn't some nice rapeseed oils that, are, oh, yeah, yeah. you know, that you can use to put on your salad. Mm. But again, it's, yeah. I believe, truly believe that each oil and fat has its own application. And I think Absolutely, yeah. for me, rapeseed oil should probably be almost always organic because of what they spray it with. Mm. And it should be drizzled on a nice salad, you know? That's my Absolutely, opinion. yeah. Do you like do you like bone marrow? Have you have you played with bone marrow at yeah. all? <laughs> Love you, it. <laughs> you you might you might have noticed I'm a bit obsessed with it as well with my books and stuff and recipes. So I I, I love it. They call it God's butter, and mm-hmm. it's um it is fantastic. Uh, you know, I talk to a lot of uh, lot of sportsmen. I've got quite a few barbecuing sportsmen friends, and they they get like bone marrow and bone broth powder to put in their their smoothies yeah. and stuff. And you know, if they've had a rough you know physical game or something and it helps their recovery their body to recover I'd, I'd like to see more bone marrow you usually the butchers are giving marrow bones to, to, the dogs. Um, to the dogs you know grannies with dogs and stuff and I'd love to see it um, as a fat being used more because it's it, I think that's a big waste you know I think that there is a huge in Britain there is a serious problem that and I think it's a rich world problem like I think that mm. a rich country problem is that or a first world problem, as they say, is that we we turn our nose down at foods. Like, you yeah. know, and you think in other countries, like, you know, like, <laughs> I don't want to be rude, but in some parts of China, they'll eat anything. Like, yeah. you know, you know I, I read something about a food scandal in China, and it was um, um, people thought they were eating squid, but it was pig anus, you know. Mm, and, you okay, think, yeah. <laughs> you know like, and I was actually thinking to myself, they'd probably eat it if they knew. Like, I don't think it would bother yeah, yeah. them. I think they were more offended that they were thought they were eating squid. And, yeah, you, yeah. and you think in England, like I went to the butchers and um, and I just said, oh, can I have a, a whole pig's liver? And I was going to slice mm. it up and portion it. 
and I love pig's liver. I, it's one of my favorites. Yeah. I don't, I don't know why. It just yeah. is. And um, and and the woman next to me goes, "Oh, I'll have some pig liver for the dog." And mm. she got it free. Yeah. yeah. And, and I paid. And I said, so okay. I don't mind. Like I, I wanted to buy it. I have no issue mm. with that. I didn't ask for it because it was free. I'm just shocked as to why you would give it her. And he goes, well, it's yeah. for the dog, isn't it? And I was like, <laughs> but surely it still has a value to you. As yeah. a like, and he goes, hmm, mm, he never thought about it. He, he, he'd never really considered mm. it. He just thought it was a, yeah. a, a gift to the customer. And I just thought, well, I, uh, for me, that animal has an intrinsic value. And yeah. just because she gave it her dog doesn't mean it's worth less than someone who was paying for it, uh, in my yeah, opinion. Yeah. So, yeah. But yeah. I do think, you know, offals, are, are, you know, like, and I guess, I don't know if bone marrow would fall under offals. I, I don't know. But I, I think they're, they're just whole Kind of does, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. And they hold huge uh, benefits for us to eat. And, yeah, yeah. you know, why take iron tablets when you can take mm. well, eat a bit of liver you know yeah uh, with but... some nice nice green veg with it some nice kale or something mm. you know it's uh yeah definitely but definitely. Liver, I... liver is one of those things that i absolutely love on the barbecue especially pig mm. liver because you can cube it up yeah. a little bit you know and on the barbecue it's brilliant i'm not a fan of lamb's liver i find it goes a bit dry for my liking yeah yeah yeah, I, I quite like kidneys, lamb kidneys. They're lovely. Yeah. yeah, grill those up and yeah, yeah, it's good. It's good. Now, um, if we're talking offal on charcoal on the barbecue, I guess that takes us back to like, like cave yeah. days, doesn't it? Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, they used, they used to eat everything. Um, you know, uh, you know, if and and they if they, that what you know what they couldn't eat at the time they try and preserve and smoking was a good way of preserving it. You know, they'd have the, the caves they'd live in and they'd let the smoke go in there and that would preserve the food and it would be sort of dry, dryish conditions, you know, and that would, would preserve the food. With your barbecue training school, what are you seeing mm. the most that people want to learn? Is it smoking? Is it barbecue? Is it a combination? Cause I think smoking is definitely something that Brits probably don't do as much. No. So it's, I mean, really, it's all the same kind of thing, really. You know, smoking is just adding something smoky to to your barbecue to make it smoke. You know, there's, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of confusion about between barbecuing, is it grilling, is it, you know, it depends if you're in America or the UK or where you are. And I mean, there's a whole thing now, and it's just called live fire cooking, and it's just cooking over fire, really. It's, you know... Um, and I, th I think that's that's you know that that's the thing you can just cook over whatever and it, if you add some smoke to it then it's smoking it's you know uh, people say oh is this a smoke or is it a barbecue or is it a grill it's you know a lot of bits of kit of kind of all of them really you know um, a, a smoker tends to be a specific thing for sort of low temperature smoking but quite often you can grill on most of them you know um, by grilling I mean direct heat you know grilling in the states is is um, you know, that sort of direct heat cooking, um, uh, smoking, barbecuing is that sort of more indirect cooking where you, you cook away from the coals with lower temperature heat usually. So there's a few different ways of cooking with, with fire and um, they, they tend to get boxed in, you know, people say, oh, is it direct or indirect or is it this? Where actually there's a bit more shades of grey really about it. You can, you can vary your cooking you could smoke something and then grill it you know and uh and that's what i quite like about it you know i suppose in my mind i think I pro there i suppose there's there's two types of smoking there, well there's probably lots of types but the ones in my mind is you've got cold smoking yeah. where where your heat is sort of separate and it goes through a pipe i guess into a and then yeah. there's, and then there's hot smoking um but then also barbecue for me or charcoal cooking or wood mm. cooking whatever it is that's also I think that's a combination of heat and smoke in my mind. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. You know, one of the things I do a lot, and it's not a Cypriot thing, um, it's just what I do, is we've got in our garden, we've got lots of uh, bay leaf plants, we've got yeah. um, thyme, and we've got rosemary. And what I'll do, when my coal's quite 
white and i've got the meat on i'll just go break a load off and i throw it on the barbecue like yeah and, and you do that every five ten minutes and you're building up this aromatic base and it's yeah. not a big thing don't get me wrong i'm not like wow yeah. it's like you know rosemary chicken it's not at all yeah. but it just it, it just gives that meat a little bit of something you know or maybe it just makes it, it does, smell yeah. nice when i'm standing next to it who knows but it all adds to part of the experience, doesn't it? But it, it will be adding smoke. I mean, they're quite powerful smokes, quite quite strong smokes, the herbs. You know, they've got a lot of oils in. Mm. They're, they're less strong over uh, open fire cooking with no lid on. You try yeah. and do that in a, a, a barbecue with a lid on and uh, you, you're going to get quite a strong oh, really? overpowering smoke quite easily. So there's, there's a real difference between open fire and lid on cooking. Everything's very much more intense with the lid. It, yeah, it keeps the flavors in. I've never experienced lid on barbecue ever. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm that guy that walks through Dobby's and I just look at the Weber and think, what's that for? Like, you know, like, is that yeah. to keep it dry <laughs> in the winter? But no, I guess, yeah, yeah. I guess, you know, and now I'm, I'm a member of your, of your Facebook group. Um, oh, where is it? I've got it here. Country. That country wood smoke. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you know, now I see people using the lid. I'm like, oh, so it actually does have a function. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people think it's just to keep the rain off, but it's uh, it, it it basically turns your your grill into a smoky oven, really, and it's it it makes it more efficient. So you're probably using quite a lot of charcoal or wood to cook with. You you go through through a lot um, with with a lid on and lid on style cooking you go through a lot less i mean literally i can cook a whole meal for a family and a couple of handfuls of charcoal which is is quite you know quite you know charcoal is a resource that that is hope mostly sustainable really good charcoal from the uk tends to be sustainable coppice you know um but they they can only provide a few percent really of our charcoal needs in the uk most of it is imported um some of it's good imported some of it's not so good imported uh but uh, i always think it's a resource that you know you should be careful with and use uh, frugally and uh, using a lid can can you can cook some amazing food uh quite you know literally using a small amount of charcoal and i, I for a lot of people that is a, a game changer um that you can cook something for for sort of 12 hours with just a li- literally a handful of charcoal or two mm. that blows people away, you know, that you can do that. Uh, and, and you kind of need that for your, um, your sort of low and slow cuts, things like briskets and ribs and things. You need to take your time a bit more with them. Uh, you know, it'd be quite hard to cook a brisket on your, your open fire It's doable. Yeah. You'd probably, probably need to use quite a, bucket load of uh, wood or something or charcoal to cook over so um yeah it's one one of the grills that do interest me somewhat and probably just listening to american podcasts like the joe rogan podcast is the traeger grills Mm. um and that's like a pellet grill isn't it and what yeah and i think every i'm just completely assuming but i think it's on a timer and it just releases a pellet into a little fire is that right or so it's like an or so they usually have like a so pellet grills are something that um has really grown in you know globally and in the uk and uh it's like a pellet hopper you pour your wood pellets in there and then there's an auger at the bottom that pushes like a screw auger that pushes them down into a fire pit and then there's a blower in there and a little uh little igniter little electric igniter so you push a button turns it on you say i want uh, 160 degrees centigrade and it starts up starts pushing the fuel in lights it the fan blows it and off you go and it sits and holds that and then it's controlling the fuel and the air to get to the coals mm. um, to give you the temperature that you want and you could just you know same as you would in an oven you can just turn the temperature up and down and it's it's very easy very easy it, it's, uh, you know, and is that too is that, easy? Oh, possibly too easy. So, so is that a that's a grill then, not a smoker, or both? Uh, it does everything. Oh, you everything. can you can you you can grill a steak. You can smoke a brisket. You can smoke low temperature foods like salmon and stuff. You know, you can do it all in in something like that. There, they are um, pretty pretty uh, versatile, really. Um, you know, I, I say I say too easy. I, I used to do a lot of work with uh, with pellet grill brands like Traeger and stuff, and I, I still do bits and pieces. Um, and people always used to come up to me and say, "Oh, isn't it cheating?" 
And I say, well, absolutely it is. It's, you know, it's taking all the, the skill, it's de-skilling it. But it for a lot of people, that's fine. They just want to cook some nice food and the food does taste really good. You're burning pure wood in in there to, to, to make some good, good flavoured food. So, you know, it, it takes away the, a bit of the skill. And I, th- I find that a lot of people want to learn the skill of fire control. And a lot of people love getting involved in that, you know, that control. And they get a sense of achievement from it. But a lot of people just want some nice food cooked outdoors. And that's great for that. It really is. I, I use them still quite a lot. They, they take the pressure off. You know, if you've got some catering or feeding a lot of people and you're rushing around doing a million other things, then... You know, that's that's a great way of taking that pressure off. I think one thing that I appreciate about this, uh, let's say, live fire cooking or just, you know, is I think I appreciate the fact that once people gain the confidence, they do start moving away from beef, chicken, pork. They do start yeah. to, you know, try different meats. And, you know, you mentioned retired beef cows earlier. Like, mm. you know, and I think that would be nice to see more people in the UK eating mutton and you know all of this different yeah, yeah. because i think it mm. does lend itself really well you know one of the reasons why a lot of people don't like lamb let's say is that it has yeah. a lamby smell it's quite fatty whereas yeah, on the barbecue yeah, yeah. But, but oh. it just drips yeah. off doesn't it? it's perfect for the barbecue it's self baking absolutely you know? yeah, yeah so so i, I can I, go on sorry go on i i, I my, my wife was never a fan of uh, of of lamb and i i get quite a lot of people who say oh don't like lamb you know it's it's greasy it's lamby it's you know it's not not nice and you cook cook them a nice butterfly leg of lamb or some nice lamb chops with crispy fat over over the coals and changes their mind my, my wife was the same she she didn't like it you know i remember cooking lamb for her and she's like i'm not sure and then she'd try it and go oh this is really good lamb loves fire definitely more than anything it loves fire it's it's yeah. wonderful and i think you know if, if people would then you know seek out some mutton or hog it um hmm. you know or goats and and again put it on the lamb and just think oh sorry on the fire even <laughs> uh, yeah and and just it, it you know be a bit more adventurous because i do I, i've said it for a long time that you know it's very unsustainable that we only eat all the prime meats you know and and yeah. we don't look at the you know i don't want to say cheaper but different varieties of meat you know another thing we yeah. don't really touch on a lot is is sort of like venison and game we don't you know and mm. again it's, it's made for the barbecue isn't it Oh, it is. I, I, I had an event here on Tuesday and I cooked some lovely venison steaks and they were they were phenomenal. So and I, I think the cheaper cuts work really well with with barbecue. I, I think that's the essence of barbecue as well is making the best out of some of the cheaper cuts. And, um, you know, that's where American barbecue's got its its roots is those cheaper cuts were given to like the, the slaves, the workers, you know, the the ribs, the briskets, the you know the tough cuts and they cook them for a long time over over fire and they taste amazing so um you know that's that's where the roots of it come from and uh, you know i think that's that's a lot i mean it's all very easy to get a nice fillet bit of fillet steak or nice prime cut of steak and cook it you know you don't need to do much bit of salt and cook it over fire and it tastes great yeah. but the challenge is taking those cheaper cuts and working with those to, to make something and i think that's where bit of fire and smoke magic really helps and uh, you know it's it's I, I mean going back to where we were earlier I think it's something that just we're not used to doing and I just want to see more of I see a lot of um, chefs are starting to get into um, they call it live fire cooking the, you know cooking over uh, over wood and embers and stuff and um, I get a lot of chefs coming to me asking for advice because it's not something in a standard chef's sort of training um and it's something that a lot of them are particularly interested in at the moment so i do get a lot coming to me for advice you know how do i how do i do this and it, it's quite exciting for them because it's something new i think we've they a lot of them are getting over the little um molecular gastronomy stuff the little beads of things you know and suddenly this fire thing which is the antithesis of all of that sous vide everything like that this this cooking with fire is something different it's you know i think we're going to see a lot lot more about that a lot a lot lot more of that uh, i saw nick nicholas exted had his um has opened a restaurant um now in london um which i want to get to uh, you know he's been over in stockholm Mi- michelin star cooking with fire no gas or electric in his kitchen 
I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of that. I've, I've got friends who build these um, these fire fire big fire pits and fire cages and stuff. They're putting an awful lot into restaurants now, and I think we're set for a big explosion in that. And uh, you know, it, it, you know, chefs are smart, aren't they? They 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 work it out pretty quick. But uh, you know, a lot of them are struggling and you know a few of them come to me and, and ask for a bit of advice and you know I'll, I'll happily help anyone really so it's uh you know it's it, it, it's definitely it's, the winds are changing as it were i think in food people want something a bit more comforting earthy homely and real i think rather than a pretty little plate, plate of food there's some and they they there's something they're still hungry there's something pretty well I, and i think i read somewhere about this but it's anecdotally at the moment but i think smoke is also um smoke is also an antiseptic so yeah. it's you know so you've got an added benefit of of the fact that the food is being cooked obviously and we know that the heat will obviously get rid of any bacteria but the smoke is pretty antiseptic as well so i think yeah. there is a healthy way to eat and i know a lot of people say to me sometimes oh it can't be healthy to cook on charcoal all the time and i actually think well yeah. i don't know i've not seen any negatives i, I, I you know yeah. i haven't you know and i'm not being funny I, human growth was was fueled by it you know yeah i think there's ways of doing it though if if you get it wrong and you burn the food or you cook over um coals that are poor quality or some you know wood that's burning in the wrong way or you know dirty smoke i think like anything there's good ways and bad ways of doing it um i you know uh i've also sort of read a lot of of research that says things like herb and olive oil base and garlic base that you put on meat are, are very good at um, reducing any effects of that so you know things like a nice chimichurri on it as a, a positive, you know, so it's getting the balance there between yeah. negatives and positives. Uh, I also think that, you know, life's a bit short and, you know, you've got to enjoy some nice time with your family and friends, especially, you know, you know, the last, last couple of years we've had and, you know, people want to be in the garden in the summer and what do they do in the, the, the summer in the garden, they, you know, light up the barbecue. Yeah. So if you can help them have a nice positive experience feeding their family and friends doing that, then, that's a good thing. That's that, that's where I'm coming from. You see more people barbecuing indoors with these new barbecues that, you know, with extraction, obviously. Like, do you, do you see that as mm. a future thing or not as much? Um, a lot of that comes from sort of Korean sort of style, you know. Um, they have the, the little charcoal grill and a big hood over the top. Uh, no, I can't see that. I, I, I mean, for indoor barbecue sort of thing, I've got like – have you seen the sort of teppanyaki grills? You can get electric teppanyaki grill and you can sit there and, you know, and do that um, fondue, that that kind of thing. That's probably a bit more indoor friendly or these nice big um, soup bowls that you can get, stock bowls, and yeah. you cook things in that. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, most people aren't set up for cooking with charcoal indoors, really, unless you've got proper extraction over over the table it's not really i guess that's for restaurants really isn't it restaurants will have that extraction won't they yeah yeah they will they will i see a lot of people wanting to do it they come on online and they go oh can i have my little grill in 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 the the lounge and i go no it's not you know it's (laughs) not not worth it really i'm just trying to think of the application but he's sitting there watching tv and he's just like yep got my skewers got my skewers like yeah just do you you know what i do see a lot of people doing is building shacks Mm -hmm. Um, in the garden, simple roof over um, over a nice sort of little seating area, you know, and um, they sit out there and they they have a little grill going. And there's been a huge explosion in uh, shacks, in outdoor bars, uh, you know. And this all goes back to the outdoor space thing that I was talking about earlier. You know, people people are longing to be outdoors and to do something. Just having a little roof over your head makes such a difference you know it's it's uh it, it, it makes it a little bit more pleasurable that you're not going to be rained on yeah no exactly and and talking of pleasure one of the things that i saw in your cookbook food fire food and fire was yeah. um was a dessert that you can do on the barbecue and i think one thing that i've really got into oddly and it's one of my treats is um mm. is a schmores you know like a a, a marshmallow 
in, in an island oh, yeah. digestive. And I don't know what, I just love the heat and the texture. Um, but then I saw a, a, like yeah. a bread roll with chocolate in it and you'd wrap it up in foil and just leave yeah. it on. And I guess, I guess again, you've got that residual heat. You know, you're not, do, you know, you've got yeah. to eat or whatever. You've still got that heat. You could actually put dessert on there and go do something else, couldn't you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, my kids love that that recipe. They love small. So, you know, why, why not do something a bit sweet at the end? Mm. Uh, I've, I've got a lovely friend called Sue Stoneman, and uh, she's she's kind of the barbecue baking queen in the barbecue community. And she'll do like pavlovas and cakes and everything on the barbecue. And it blows me away what she can do, really. It's, uh, you know, I'm not, you know, I, I do simple puddings, you know, it's not really my my sort of thing. Uh, so much pudding but uh, um, you know I I do like to do sort of you know um, some grilled fruit or something and uh, you know some nice grilled figs or peaches something simple like that you know I like but uh, But a whole dessert um, like a a cake dessert (laughs) yeah yeah yeah. she's took it to a whole new level isn't she Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm too much of a tinkerer, like with flavors and with recipes and stuff. And I tinker, tinker. And you can't do that so much with, with baking. I, no, don't, I agree. Don't think, you know, it's, I agree. It's, uh, you know, so yeah. what was the motivation behind your new book, Steward? Like, you know, and, and what sort of, cause I've not read it yet and I'm hoping to get a copy soon. So what, what was sort of motive, yeah. what was the motivation behind it and what's different between food and fire? So food and fire was very much my sort of, um, uh, you know, I didn't want to focus on American smoking. I wanted to see what sort of styles of cooking from around the world would would appeal to us in the UK, um, and and get some Brit- good British food in there as well. Uh, skewered, um, so that that came about. So I was looking at a few different options, and uh, I, I looked at what books were out there, and there was nothing at all in the UK for for like cooking skewers over fire and actually you look around the world people the majority of people who cook over fire are cooking on on sticks on cooking on skewers and uh to not have a a uk book on on that subject was a a bit of a gap and I, i love it i you know i've been very lucky i've done a lot of traveling in my time and you know, you go to some of these places like Thailand, they have lov- lovely little sort of skewers, prawns on skewers, Indian tandoor, you know. I remember having uh, having amazing seafood tandoors on, on, on the cliffs in, 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 in Kerala in southern India. Nice. And one wonderful way of cooking on on a on a skewer so um, you know and you little, little yakitori in japan you know so so many different ways of cooking on a skewer um let, let, i haven't even gone to the european sort of skewers you know uh you, you know all the kebabs the middle eastern stuff you know i mean so so many uh different ways of cooking on skewer and i just thought well what do we do with skewers on our barbecue in the UK? Usually, we usually get a bit of random vegetables, maybe a bit of tofu or halloumi or a bit of chicken. Put it on a grill that's probably not that hot, and um, you know everything sort of shrivels up. We've all had those little tiny button mushrooms; they shrivel up to little leathery things. <laughs> and um, there's very little. Uh, um, what's the word very little inspiration with with cooking on skewers on a barbecue in in the uk and i just thought what an opportunity to write a book on this subject uh luckily my publisher agreed with me and saw saw the 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 opening there as well so um yeah that that that's gone really well so um i think yeah i think in terms of skewers i think i think one of the problems is and I, you know, I see it sometimes. Is that, and this is one thing that I don't like about what butchers do, is that they use yeah. the seasonings. Um, you know, yeah. they're like you'll have a barbecue one or a Chinese one or whatever, and they you know, the yeah. majority of that product is sugar. And you know, mm. you know what? You know, you put anything on the barbecue with sugar on it, it's going to take, mm. it's going to burn pretty fast. Yeah, yeah. Or, or at yeah. least it's going to mislead your eye in thinking, oh, that's ready because it's dark and brown. You know, yeah. and that's why I don't really. I understand why they add. I understand why they add sugar to the seasonings. Well, there's two reasons. One is to make it really cheap and highly profitable. Yeah. The other one is to um, um, it uh, forces the the myosin, the protein, out of the product to then create yeah. this nice glaze. Um, but for me, yeah. I've just never been a big fan of them because I think it really throws your eye off when you're looking at a, you know a product cooking and you think, oh, that's got to be ready, and you pull it off and it's, it's not ready. Mm. It's nowhere near ready. 
And you know, I, I think I think I agree with you, Matt. Well, I do agree with you massively. So those those flavorings, they're pretty. They're just from a big bucket of flavoring, and you know what 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 your standard British barbecue is. People go to butchers or retail, you know, supermarket, and they'll they'll buy these standard things that are all flavored the same and they'll burn them they they haven't got a temperature probe to check that it's cooked through and like you say the sugars burn um i'm i'm not a huge uh marinader i'm more of a baster so i i'd rather build up the crust and then hit that with a nice sort of flavorful base uh, i find marinating tends to make the meat a bit soggier yeah. and um it it, for me, it's less exciting, uh, soggy, soggy meat. It's harder to build a nice crust and, and sear up on it. So I'm more of a fan of basting. Um, and uh, I, I, yeah, for, for me, those those products they 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 do put a lot of people off because they think, oh, it's it's cooked through, and you know you can't tell visually from the outside. I one of the things I tell a lot of people is to get a, a probe thermometer um, when they're starting out. It's one of the absolute First, first sort of um, essential rules really for barbecuing is to be able to know what temperature your meat is on the inside. And you, like you say, you can't tell from the outside. So putting a probe thermometer in will tell you your chicken's cooked, you know, safely. And it'll tell you your your beef's medium rare, for example. And, and I that's a bit of a game changer for a lot of people. That's an eye opener that they can say, oh, I can put this probe in and it'll tell me my meat's safe to cook safe to eat and enjoyable and that that blows a lot of people away why why every home hasn't got one of those i don't know i think they they should have yeah they should have i came through my you know my younger years let's say i I worked for my dad in his fish and chip business and Mm. every summer we had nothing but complaints and you'd get people Mm. come in and say oh, I've got food poisoning. And you'd be like, oh, um, where, what did you eat from us? Oh, I just had some chips. All right, okay, great. Uh, well, it's mm. very rare that you'd get food poisoning from chips. Like, you know, it's, it's yeah. not going to happen. Um, so you tell, where you been? Mm. Oh, I went to a barbecue. Oh, my mate had a barbecue or, or whatever. And it was always around that. Yeah. I think it's the fact that, yeah. you know, someone took a sausage off too early. I'm going to say all the stereotypical British things. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone took a chicken leg off too early because it looked okay. And I think mm. they eat it and they're just thinking about a beer and, you know, you don't realise that mm. that chicken leg you just ate had a bit of pull on it. You just, you don't realise. Yeah. And, and, and I think this is one of the issues. And I think for me, until you're skilled at sort of when I say skilled, I don't mean in a showy off way. Until you've mm. built your confidence and your intuition up, I would stay away from marinades. I would just say, you know, mm. the only thing I'm going to use is salt and pepper. And and when yeah. when I then figure out how meat looks and how it feels, you know, I'm a big mm. I like to touch, like to make sure, you know, what's it what sort of feedback is it giving me? Uh, yeah, yeah. But yeah, you know, one thing that I saw recently at a barbecue is that someone had um um an infrared uh temp yeah. probe but they were using yeah. it on the barbecue and i was trying to say well okay. you're catching sort of the the residual heat off everything else so yeah, yeah. so you now yeah. think that that's oh yeah it's great it's 100 no 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 it's not the area no no you know. so yeah I, I think a physical probe you take your meat off for a split second just quickly press it is it okay yeah, yeah. um yeah uh, but yeah, I don't know. I think, I think for me, just those flavors, uh, you know, they're negative with mm. those flavors. That they all taste the same. You might get a Chinese yeah. one, and you eat that, and the barbecue one tastes exactly the same. And it's because the main component yeah, yeah. is sugar. You know. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, no, I'd, I'd much rather whip up a nice batch of fresh herbs and garlic and a bit of chili, olive oil. You know, and and serve that. You know, I'm a big fan of chimichurri. I think that's. Uh, that's an amazing condiment that's still yet to see see a, a growth in popularity. Um, I did see who was it? Uh, burger King are doing a um, an Argentinian um, burger with chimichurri on. I think nice. so. Uh, I think it's it. You know, it's it's going to come. I think like you know, smokehouse is becoming a thing now as well. Argentinian flavors. I think that's that's the the next trend I'm sort of seeing in food is is you know. Uh, I think at the moment with like peak brisket, we're sort of peak smokehouse. Everyone's saying I want to cook a brisket on a smoker, and that and that's really good. But what after? And people like myself who've been around a few years, always looking at you know the next things. And Koreans, that sort of you know style cooking is is amazing. And um, Argentinian, you know, over over wood embers is is a lot of ha- seeing a lot of interest at the moment. So, so. you're a fan of also. I've seen you put the meat 
on the coal or a lump of coal yeah. on the meat. Now, yeah. how does that even work? Because I can't even, like, again, I'm not knocking it because it looks great to me, but how do you do mm. that without getting all the dust and shit on it? Like, you know, how do you, how do you, because, <laughs> because that, that, how do you scrape that off or does it not stick? There's, so, so it's a really so a lot of people see that and um, they get a bit nervous about it. So the key is to have really good quality charcoal. Okay. So lump wood charcoal, the best quality you can get. The you know the real you know uh, the sustainable nice brown bag proper charcoal. Uh, if you've got dust on your charcoal, it's possibly not, or the bag's been ha- mishandled, or it's possibly not the greatest quality charcoal certainly you'd never use it with briquettes because they're ashy and they had fuel um, as well didn't they so yeah yeah so um you know so best quality lumpwood charcoal get it red hot and you know you know when you get like uh wood that burns down to embers you get a very fine white ash on it mm-hmm. that would be at the most on good quality charcoal that would be the most on the surface and what i do is i give it a blow you know blow of air just to remove any surface ash and then the steak goes straight onto the charcoal or whatever i'm cooking goes straight onto the charcoal and i I love it doing it on on my basic it's literally the first thing i do on my basic class i do a dirty steak and people say i thought it was going to be like dirty and ashy and i'd have to brush off the dust and the coals and you show it to them you flip it over and there's no charcoal nothing stuck to it no ash it's beautiful and then i'll brush it with like a sort of herb base, I said, um, you know, garlicky herby based, and uh, it's it's phenomenal. It's really good. It's it's my favourite way to cook a steak. It's not the only way I cook a steak on a barbecue, <laughs> but it's 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 my favourite way. Um, and there's something very elemental about it. It's simple. It goes back to caveman style. It's you know, I call it a dirty steak, but it's also known as a caveman steak um, because I I imagine that is how the cavemen used to cook their big bits of meat. They chuck it on the on the coals of a fire and cook it slice bits off and jobs are good and uh who's it, it I, eisenhower was a big fan of it so it's also called an eisenhower steak over in the states yeah. so um yeah it's it's something that is definitely worth a try and uh the the charcoal is the key quite often i get people come back to me and they say oh, oh, i tried your dirty steaks mate you don't know what you're on about it was horrible. It was bitter, gritty, nasty. They go, and I say, what what charcoal did you use? And they usually go, oh, I use uh, briquettes. And I say, well, there you go. That's that's why. Then uh, I had one lovely gentleman come back to me, and he's um, quite uh, quite to the point about it. And he said, you don't know what you're on about. And uh, I said, oh, what what charcoal did you? He's expecting him to say briquettes. He said, no, no, I, I cooked it on my gas grill. I said, how did you cook? dirty steak on your gas grill and you know you get the lava rock on the bottom of some gas grills he cooked it on there basically and um you know and then told me i didn't know what i was talking about so, you see, with briquettes uh, my wife won't let me afterwards with the ash she won't let me just stick it in the mm, pile and the grass or, or, or no, she just says no. i don't like it they've got fuel in them i don't whether there's any left or not who knows i don't know but mm. she's just never liked it now if i use just normal wood and normal lump wood you know, yeah. I always save ash anyway. I've got a bucket for the ash because I used it yeah. just in case later on if I've got a bit of, you know, yeah. a bit of extra fatty belly that needs that yeah. dripping and I put it down. Um, but yeah, like she she doesn't like it. She just says it's got fuel in it. And, and I usually just put it in like oh. a corner of the garden where there's a bit of soil where we grow stuff. Like my thought process is normal ash without fuel would yeah. probably be good, you know, good for the, the soil, you know. I think so, yeah. Um, um, not well. No, I do a bit of gardening, but um, you know, uh, quite often I'll put the little bit of charcoal left in the bag, the dust at the bottom on the garden. Um, it's kind of like yeah. biochar, and I think charcoal's good. Um, you know, the ash is good. Uh, so the the problem with briquettes, most briquettes, is you don't know the source of the the wood that um, has has um, has produced briquettes. There are some really good briquettes out there. I've had coconut shell briquettes, which are fantastic. Uh, I've also had ones made out of olive wood pip and quality fruit wood where they state the woods on it. So there are good uh, briquettes out there, um, but uh, a lot of them are, are, are dubious in the origin. So um, I would be a bit more careful with them. Yeah. No, I guess, I guess. So where can people find you, Marcus, if they want to come on your training school? Where do they go? 
So ukbarbecueschool.com and uh, I've got, yeah, I've got a few different classes I do there. Um, most people can find me on social media, either UK Barbecue School or um, or Country Wood Smoke. I am on, on a lot of places, ever except Twitter, where I'm, I'm uh, Devon Wood Smoke for whatever reason. <laughs> and um, I've also got a, a, a magazine that I've been, um, I've been, uh, so I started about five or six years ago, and it's doing really well. It's uh, called The Barbecue Mag, and that is um, a great magazine for people who like outdoor cooking. And uh, it's it's brilliant. It's printed magazine now, so um, nice. that's pretty, pretty good. But, uh, yeah. And, and your books are available in most bookstores, I guess. I don't yeah, just, all good bookstores. I, yeah, I don't just want to say the big A, but I, yeah, yeah. that's where I get my books from. But I, yeah, yeah. I want to... I let people decide where they buy their books. From, Absolutely, right? yeah. So, uh, food and fire and uh, and skewered are available lots of different places. So, uh, mm. yeah, ho- hopefully people enjoy them. Oh, I'm sure they will, mate, because there is something about, like you say, there is something about that, you know, cooking on the fire or with fire or mm. with, you know, and I think your books just really epitomise that. I think, you know, I, I think you, you sort of go into any book like that and think, oh, it's just going to be the same thing, but it's not. Yeah. There's a lot more to it in my view. And I think you've, you know, and I, I can't wait to get your other book, but I think that f- f- food and fire, I really did enjoy it. I did. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I, I'm really proud of that. Well, I'm proud of, proud of them both, but um, for me, it, it was the, the important bit was taking people on a bit of a journey with it and, um, you know, giving them, so you give, them the tools to cook and then they go off and they go on their own journey and that's that's what i've been about with barbecuing is giving people a bit of the knowledge and then opening the door for them Um, i'm a big fan of uh, nigel slater um, and his books i love his cooking style because he says in his recipes he says oh you can you know this is my recipe and then the the bit bit at the bottom he says i'll try it with celeriac instead of potatoes or try it with this herb instead of this and he's opening the door and then he's letting you go off on your own journey and i like that rather than the very strict formal you must do this recipe in this way um and and that suits barbecue because it is barbecue is definitely a journey yeah and it's a and you can be loose with it. You don't have to. It's not like, you know, baking. You, mm. you know, by changing one thing, you know, you know, like I very rarely weigh anything out. So if I, if I'm, yeah. if I, you know, one of my recipes is um, uh, mint and sumac and I put that on lamb or chicken yeah. and I'm not measuring anything. It's loads of meat for the yeah. most part. <laughs> And then it's cubed up and then I throw loads of mint over it and loads of sumac mm. and some olive oil and mm. always lots of garlic. Every recipe has lots of garlic. And I yeah, just yeah. think you can be really uh, indelicate, let's say. Just you yeah. know, what's the worst that's going to happen when you're cooking on the barbecue? Mm. Now, I guess where you have to be specific is when you start smoking things over a long yeah. period, which I don't do. And I guess that's yeah. where you come in anyway. Yeah, I, but even then, smoke the smoking is a bit more of an art, really. It's um, you know, it, it, it's it's hard to it's hard to teach, and it's certainly hard to write a book about because books need um, times that are precision, they need weights that are precision, and that's probably the thing I found the hardest was getting things that I'm like, oh, a dash of this, a bit of that, and you know, with a book, you need precision yeah. and barbecuing is probably one of the least precise of um cooking cooking techniques people say oh how long is that going to take and quite often i go I, I don't know it's it's ready it's ready when it's ready it's ready when it hits the right temperature or the right tenderness or um it's ready when i think it's ready and they're like oh okay and um people cook to 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 time too often and that was one of the hardest things to put in a recipe book was um trying to get people away from the time you know the the the, the publishers wanted timings in there and you know i i do i do a, a roast beef joint on my uh, a three kilo roast beef joint on my basic class um and i do that week in week out i've been doing that for five or six years i put salt and pepper on it put it just to the side of the coals with the lid on and um i've had it to just under an hour at the same sort of 200 degrees. I've had it do just under an hour. Uh, I've had it take two and a half hours. And, uh, you know, it's, it's that, um, that imprecision, you know, it, it always hits like 47, 48 degrees C when I take it off. 
and uh, and then rest it. But getting to that time, and it depends the temperature it was at the fridge, how long I've had it at the fridge, the ambient temperature of the outdoors, if it's a cold day, what fuel I'm burning, how much moisture is in the meat, how much fat's around the meat, so many different things. And that's just the roast beef joint that takes an hour or two. You, you scale that up to something like a brisket. Now, brisket, you know, low and slow can be 14 hours. Um, the quickest I've had one done is sort of six or seven hours cooked. Uh, you know, that's seven hours different. So, um, you know, to say, well, it might take seven hours, it might take 14 or 16 hours, you know, um, <laughs> that's quite a big window. <laughs> and I think, you know, it takes me back to like when we cook barbecue here, it's like, you know, the last half an hour, that's when mm. everything sort of happens because, you know, you yeah. know, if, if the wife's cooking other things to go with it, mm. we're constantly talking to each other. Like, so you can get, make everything match, you know. Yeah. And, I, and I think, you know, I think you're right. I think you can't, you know, and you can't just stick to a time. You, this is where intuition comes in. This is where experience mm. comes in mm. and not to be hard on yourself because no two cuts of meat are the same. No. So, you know, I think it always makes me laugh. Though. I remember someone sent a meme around where it was a Facebook meme, I think. And, mm. and it said, um, the man gets all the credit at the barbecue. Um, but the woman cut the salad. She cut the meat. She went and bought the meat. Yeah. She, um, you know, prepared it all, skewered it all. Man cooks the meat. Woman does all the dessert, all the sides, yeah. everything. Everyone says the man did a great job. Yeah. But if you think we only did the cooking of the meat, you know? yeah. so yeah, I, I mean that that yeah, it's, I've, I've seen that meme loads. It gets shared in my, my <laughs> Facebook group. I, I I really really want to see more women barbecuing. Um, yeah. There there are some there's some great women barbecuers in the UK. Um, some really great ones you know I've got you know a lot of them are my very good friends um, I want to see more women barbecuing I, I am your stereotypical male barbecuer I'm overweight I'm a dad I'm balding um, I, I you know all your stereotypes for the dad barbecuer I, I want to see more women barbecue just because I want to see more people barbecue I want to see more people enjoy it and uh, you know uh, I, th I think there is such a, a small amount of women barbecuing, um, and why? You know, I, 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 there's no, there's no. It's it's the stereotype: man, fire, meat, barbecue sort of thing. And a, actually, uh, why should women only cook indoors and men outdoors? It's not. It's you know, it's not. Um, it's not 1900. It's uh, you no, know, it's not sure. caveman times. I, I, I'd love to. You know, I get. I I probably get 10 percent of women on my class. Um, and uh, I had a, a wonderful, um, this sticks with me, I had a, a wonderful lady, um, she was 86, called Thelma, and she was a bit of a superstar, so she turned up on one of my classes, and she was um, she was one of these amazing energy, you know, and she said, she said, oh, my husband's been um, barbecuing um, for, for, you know, our lives together, we've travelled lots, and she said, I've, I've always wanted to have a go. And um, she came on my class and, and learned how to barbecue. And that is amazing to see see that. And, uh, you know, what, why shouldn't more women bar not barbecue? That's, that's. Mm -hmm. uh, I know, I know for a fact, my wife could do it. She, you know, she easily, I, I, you know, she says to me, like, if you want me to get started, yeah, whatever. Like, we've never actually gone the whole hog and done the whole swap around. Yeah. But, you know what? Maybe it is one of those things that where the men just say, you know what, I'm going to go out in the garden away from the kids. I'm just going yeah. to do my thing. But the kids end up following me anyway. So it's not like it, yeah. you know, it's like you said, they just want to see the fire, don't they? So, ooh, yeah, yeah. Like, you know? yeah. so yeah, my kids always follow me always. So, yeah. you know, they've got like this little toy barbecue with all these like vegetables and everything. They, they pretend and they're just like, oh, look, we're doing it too. And I'm like, yeah. yeah and, and I think it gives How old are they, your, your kids? They little, little. Uh, Alex is seven. And Nicholas is three in February, so seven and three. Yeah. 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 So my so. my kids have always had their own proper barbecue. Okay. Um, so my son uh, Louis is seven, and he's had a, a little gr little gas grill. He 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 sort of he's given, and um, he's been he can cook steak on it, burgers, yeah. chicken. Uh, my eldest has been cooking since he was probably five or six, I'd say. And um, his speciality is chicken on the bone. He calls it chicken chicken thighs, and he, he loves doing that. Uh, my daughter Elsie's a bit; she loves seafood, so she's got nice. her own her own grill, and she cooks uh, sort of salmon and prawns and tuna on it. She loves that. So, 
um yeah it's okay. it's it's quite nice my my kids have learned respect to fire of knives um mm -hmm. you know over the years they, they know you know and, and i think teaching giving those kids skills like that is really important so yeah. hopefully your, yours will be ready for it soon and uh mm. that, that also gives me more confidence actually to do that yeah. actually because yeah. you know if they could do the barbecue, it saves me a job, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can well, sit Marcus, back and enjoy a cold beer. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be nice. So, yeah. But no, I think that the best way to enjoy any form of alcohol is with quiet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and yeah. They, don't, they don't give me that. So yeah. uh, it's like, dad, dad, dad. Yeah. So no, Mark has been absolutely great, mate. And oh, um, pleasure, mate. You know, I encourage everyone listening to sort of go and get your books. You know, I've already added a few people to your group today, actually. And I've been in that yeah, group you. for a while. And, you know, and there is something to learn. And you know what? It's not a snobby twattish group, actually. Like I must no. admit, like, obviously, there's always the odd bickering. It's a group. It's just yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, you know, it's not, you know, I think for the most part, people are helpful. And there's enough people in there that they all help each other, you know. Yeah. It's quite yeah. We, we're all about supporting supporting people, whatever stage of their journey. If they're just starting to get into it, they can come in and feel that they can ask a question and say, look, how do I like my barbecue? And people won't, you know, um, you know, they won't they won't denigrate that. And then, you know, up to experienced chefs who who you know who want to learn a bit more you know there's something for everyone in there really um yeah, and right. when, when i set it up country would smoke there, there weren't any any real groups in the uk for barbecuing there was very little on it um and uh you know i i just wanted to support that in a really positive way mm. well, i think you've done it i think you are doing well, it thank you well, yeah thank you. and uh, well thank you for your time today mate oh pleasure mate thank have you have a great one have a good one cheers take care Massive thank you to Marcus for joining me today in episode 114 of the Sarah's podcast. If you want to follow Marcus or learn more about the barbecue training school, then look at all the links in our show notes. Be sure to share this podcast with friends and on social media. If you like this episode, chances are they will like it too. 